Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Public Inventors, the Invention Inventors Gathering. We do this every third Thursday of the month. Um, today, I'm delighted to have someone that I don't know very well, um, an IGDOR researcher named Gavin Taylor, who is also on the board of uh, IGDOR. Um, he's going to mostly introduce himself, um, but he's an interdisciplinary researcher whose work has taken him from tropical rainforest, in fact, he's in Brazil right now, uh, to national laboratories. He's um, progressively embraced aspects of open source during his research career and now supports open and replicable, replicatable research practices in his role on the global board of the Institute for Globally Distributed Open Research Education. And that's what IGDOR stands for. Since leaving academia, Gavin has explored ways to continue doing research as an independent researcher, which led him to connect with the diverse world of indie and alt academia, which uh, I suppose I'm in the diverse world of indie and alt academia, but I'm, I'm interested in learning about it because I don't think I, uh, I, I know as much about it as I should. Um, in this talk, Gavin will provide an overview of six principles of open science, open source is only one, and an overview of the support virtual research institutions such as IGDOR can provide for independent uh, researchers. So um, take it away, Gavin, thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, I, I will just go into presentation mode and share the screen. Yeah, you might, uh, you might add, do you want to be interrupted with questions or do you want us to hold our questions till the end? Um, I'm happy to take questions throughout. I think that's fine. Okay. So given that we have a small group here, you can just come off mic. And, but if you prefer not to speak on the microphone, you can chat something into the window and I'll ask it of Gavin. Um, go ahead, Gavin. Thank you. Yeah. And that sounds good. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Well, everyone see the slides? Yes. Great. Yeah. Um, so actually, I, I met Rob at... Um, Public Innovation uh, Invention Gala, I think in um, in March, and I came across Public Invention because I was interested in in the hardware project, and I was hoping I could make that open source. But um, actually, even though uh, open source is kind of a, a principle of open science, I hadn't really had much um, uh, involvement with open source hardware. I've mostly just been involved with open source software. So I came along to Public Invention to try and find out a bit more about that and, and really enjoyed what I saw. So um, I was glad to, to meet the community. I'm hoping to learn a bit more from it. But I also, yeah, I'm glad of the opportunity to present a bit about uh, my own experience with open science and also what I've been learning about um, independent research and my, my organization, IGDOR. So yeah, I'm going to go over all of these. Um, as we noted, there are six six aspects of open science, and, and open source is really only one of them. Um, I don't have a great introductory picture for <laughs> independent research, um, but what I do have is the cover of um, what is the first and possibly only book um, written along uh, about this topic, which is um, Ron Gross's book on independent scholarship, which is from uh, the early 80s, I think. Um, and yeah. I'm going to talk a bit about IGDOR at the end because uh, as an institute, um, it aims to support both open science um, and also independent researchers. So open science has really grown as a movement over the last decade, or maybe 15 years. And to be honest, it's kind of become more complicated over that time. Um, so for instance, I've got a definition here from an EU project called FOSTER. Um, that aims to promote open science. And you know, they concentrate on things being freely available. They concentrate on being able to reuse the outputs of research. Um, but overall, they put down like quite a lot of different points and it's quite complicated. And if you look at um, other definitions of open science, you find that, yeah, in, in general, they're, they're, they're not that straightforward. Um, so I actually like this definition um, that uh, a former colleague, uh, a man called John Tennant, um, he had a quote that open science is just good science. And, and really, when you talk to the public and they find out that a lot of publicly funded research is behind paywalls, so they can't access articles and journals, or that data that was used in clinical trials isn't publicly available, 
they can find that kind of frustrating because yeah, the publicly funded um, research outputs that, that aren't accessible um, and they're not accessible to the public and they're often not accessible to other researchers. Um, but yeah, if you're doing open science, some people say it's really just the bare minimum for doing good science, for ensuring that the work you do can then be reused and replicated by other people in the research community and the rest of the society. So if you look on the, the Wikipedia page for um, for open science, you won't find this this picture it comes from the article in the bottom right, but people, people often talk about these six um, principles or pillars of, of open science. And so I'm not actually going to talk at all about open source today. I think that probably the group at public convention really has covered that um, in a lot of detail. Although, as I said, um, I think the, the open science movement doesn't have too much involvement with um, open source hardware so much. A lot of involvement with open source software, particularly um, software that's used for data analysis, um, not so much hardware. But I think that's starting to change with groups like, um, I think it's the gathering for open source hardware, gosh. Um, and yeah, that there's more interest in, in open source hardware. There's also making your methods open. There's making your um, articles open, making the data that you produce during research open, doing peer review openly during the publication process, and finally trying to make some educational resources that are open for students and also for other educators to come in and modify. So a lot of people's first exposure to open science um, comes during the publication process uh, through open access publishing. And before, well, 20 years ago, there was only one route to publication, which was um, going through a subscription journal. You didn't have to pay to put anything there, except sometimes you paid to have color figures because um, they were printed. But then everything was behind the subscription paywall. So if you didn't have an expensive subscription to the journal, then you couldn't access much of that research. And that kind of built on the old fashioned model of actually printing like physical journals. And, and then it made sense to publish them this way. But uh, with the advent of the internet, there were more publishing options that became available. And so nowadays, if you are publicly funded or um, and many research institutions, you'll be required to make um, your, your research outputs open access. So what does that mean? Um, there's a few to doing this as well. <laughs> the easiest route is what's called the green open access model, which is basically where you just post a copy of your manuscript in a repository. Um, there's a variety of different repositories you can use. Um, and that isn't necessarily associated with the journal, but you you have the, the article, the draft article you've written, it's posted, it's out there. Um, and then that's something that anyone can access. And then you can later go on and submit that to most journals. Some of them don't like you posting preprints, but the majority of them, majority of journals are on board with that now. And that's essentially enough to do open access publishing. If you actually want to publish it so that your journal article that's typeset and you know, has the, the header of, of nature or science um, is then open access, you, you, could, you often end up paying um, an article processing charge. Um, sometimes journals only publish open access or sometimes a hybrid where you can choose to pay open access or not. Um, and that kind of pushes the, the cost of the publication. It takes it from the reader the, the, who would be subscribing previously and pushes that onto the, the author. Um, and that that's the way that kind of, yeah, a lot of the open science community has gone. Um, funders or universities often pay these charges, um, but they get a bit outrageous. So if you want to publish in Nature, Nature's a, now a hybrid open access journal, you can either do that for free if it's going to be closed access, or I think you pay about ten or $11,000 if you want to make it open access. Um, and people question whether or not it's actually worth that, um, whereas you could just post... Um, a draft of your, your initial manuscript in a repository and still get it published in nature, but it would, would be open access for free. Um, and there's now a lot of support for the diamond open access um, model, which is interesting because uh, it aims not to charge anyone. <laughs> it aims to have no charge for authors and no charge for the readers, um, which creates a little bit of a difficult financial situation for, for journals, like how do they pay for this? Um, but there are community journals, um, for instance, that are run by scholarly associations. They may have income from running conferences or other events, and they use that to then subsidize uh, publishing their, their association's journal. Um, and that seems to be very promising, but 
I think it um, overall it looks like the academic community is moving um, down that kind of gold and, and hybrid route with our processing charges, but we, we'll see how that evolves um, in the future. Well, Rob just raised a hand, so maybe you ask a question. Yeah, I, I hope I don't know if I'm interrupting or if you're done with this slide. So on this slide, um, you're not saying that one of these it's arranged vertically, but you're not saying that one is necessarily better than the other. You're just listing the accepted names for different ways that these publication mechanisms work. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm not trying to rank these here. I, I would probably, if I would rank them vertically, I'd probably put diamond at the top and maybe green above gold. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't make this chart, but it's not intended to 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 show which is better, just to um, describe which is which and that their features. You know, I, I think this is a problem. Um, one organization I worked for, we just paid, I think, $3,000 as an article processing charge for open access paper that I was an author on. It happened to be 35 pages long. And so it, it was because it was a very long paper that the costs were so high. But you can imagine as an independent researcher paying $1,000 or up to $3,000 is, is quite a lot, um, especially if you're trying to publish five or 10 papers a year, right? Uh, you know, and of course, the fact that a professor at an institution, th if the institution is covering those costs, they have no particular incentive to put pressure on the journal to decrease those costs because the costs are being paid for them by the institution. Um, I do have a specific question about the green model. So um, I have used preprint journals, uh, servers, does the, the green model typically, does that involve peer review or does it mean since it's a preprint, it's not peer reviewed and you simply publish it and then the reviews are accomplished by comments or uh, or is, is there typically a peer review process built into the green model? Yeah, so the um, in the green model, it uh, wouldn't you, well, it's separating publication from peer review, where they're usually grouped together in the traditional journal system. Um, so it's the way that you can make articles published in closed access journals, open access, because you posted the paper in, um, and then you've got it peer reviewed by the journal. Um, but there are now additional services uh, that specifically focus on uh, reviewing preprints. Um, and that's what people are calling the um, publish review curate model. And it's kind of aiming to entirely unbundle the, the journal publishing process. So you have like a specific service that does the publication, another one that, that does the reviewing, and then maybe a journal comes in and puts it together and provides some more context and, and typesetting and uh, maybe a nice and <laughs> respectable name for it that increases the credibility. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I hope that's progressing. No, I do, I do come back uh, actually to open review a bit later on, but there's a lot of innovation in, in, in preprint pre-review at the moment. Um, and I would just mention um, for people to, who are looking into um, finding journals to publish open access, there, there are a lot of open access journals in a lot of fields. Unfortunately, there are also a lot of predatory journals which have popped up, um, which publish open access without really doing any peer review. So if you're a little bit unsure where um, to publish, a good reference is this directory of open access journals, Stage. Um, and if if your open access journal is in there, then it, even if they're not charging fees uh, or very low fees, um, they're probably still a respectable journal that's doing peer review. So the next um, thing I want to talk about is open data. So open data is kind of new, I suppose, uh, in that it's publishing your data. And 30 years ago, people didn't really do this. They published journal articles and they put their data into figures or tables. Um, usually in summary statistics, but they didn't actually put the raw data out there. And this has been enabled by different um, uh, services on the internet. Um, some of the main ones I put here, like Zenodo and, and Figshare and Dryad. Um, and they're kind of very large uh, yeah, data repositories like these ones, but there's also different, lots of different field specific ones. Um, and you can find registries like R3, data um, that, that can be good to find the appropriate repository for your data. Um, but yeah, initially the, the open data movement is really focused on kind of providing the 
uh, infrastructure through repositories in order to pick for you to publish your data um, and post it along with your publications. Um, and however, there's a few more things that people should be thinking about, I think, when they're thinking about open data. Um, one of them is called the FAIR principles. And this is mostly considered at the level of repositories, but it's good if um, the actual researcher is aware of them. So basically, um, you want to make your data, make sure your data is findable. This often um, means choosing a repository that's, for instance, well indexed. It's going to give uh, a DOI, a digital object identifier. Um, it's going to get into kind of the Google metric system. Um, yeah, the accessibility comes from having posted it uh, on the repository. Other people can come and download it. Interoperability is good. Um, basically, here you're you're thinking about, oh, can I use like a standardized data format? Will other people be able to read my data? Uh, is it is it going to be like yeah, easy for them to reuse? Uh, which which comes to the final step of reusability, and this is kind of about licensing. Like, if you post your data out there with a closed license that says people can't reuse it, even though it's accessible, it's probably not very useful for other people. But if if you actually go and say, oh, you know, we're allowing people to re remix this and and use it under a different Creative Commons license, then it's really much more useful for other researchers. And this ties into um, what's now known as research data management, which is also kind of yeah, a newer concept. In the past, people would just, oh, they have a experiment they want to run, they're going to go and collect the data and then analyze it and publish it, and they don't really think too much about, well, okay, what are we going to do for kind of data aftercare? How can I make sure it's preserved? Um, whereas research data management is really kind of coming into this orange part of the circle, thinking, well, okay, first of all, before I even collect the data, how have I got a plan for putting in a repository, for maybe doing anonymization if I'm working with clinical data so that it can be shared, um, and maybe even for like reusing data that other people have posted um, beforehand um, so that I can possibly avoid collecting some data myself. Um, so now this research data management life cycle is, is um, being discussed much more and is part of open data, um, but goes beyond just making the data open. So the next point is open methodology. This is something that people did um, before open science in the sense that if you wrote an article, ideally there was enough information in there that another researcher could come along and actually reproduce that experiment. But if you ever looked at the methods paper of an article, you might realize that, well, there's a lot of things that are just tacit knowledge of the field or kind of unspoken <laughs> that, you know, people in the field would typically know in order to reproduce the experiment. But if you're an outsider from a different field um, or, yeah, for a variety of reasons, even if you're not from the same lab, you might not be able to reproduce that exactly. So it's good to put some effort this is part of our open methodology to like transparently writing your your articles with the goal um, that other researchers will be able to reproduce them. Uh, and Rob's got his hand up again, so be the yeah. I just want I don't want to miss the opportunity to comment right now. Um, Lawrence Kinchelow and I, who are in here right now, have in in the last three months we've read two papers uh, that had reproduction protocols, but they used electrodes. And they didn't have enough information about the nature of the electrodes for us to be able to reproduce it. And, and so this is a, a very real problem. And you can understand why an author may not want to spend the time giving exact reproduction instructions because, of course, they're busy. But it, it's a very serious problem if, if you're trying to actually make research reproducible. Uh, so thank you. I just wanted to comment on that. Yeah, no, thanks, Rob. I, uh, I've also had things that I was not able to to reproduce based in pa from from papers, and um, it's frustrating when you you think, oh, well, this looks really exciting, but we can't actually figure out how to do it. And yeah, ideally, the author will be responsive and help you out, but they don't always have time, um, and um, that like adds an extra level of friction. So it's great if all the information is just there. Um, so yeah, uh, I put a put a link in here. Um, I'm going to share the, the slides later, so if people want to access these these links, um, that'll be possible, but yeah, there's a great paper um, focused on psychology, but talking about how to write your articles transparently. Um, and actually, yeah, from the 
perspective of biology, there's now popping up that there's different services that aim to facilitate, um, mostly from, from the biological sciences and biomedicine, facilitate having an open methodology where it's a service like um, BioProtocol or Protocols IO, where you, you write the protocol in there, that's kind of a separate standalone object that you then reference from your paper. Um, and then if you're just reusing that protocol in multiple different experiments, you don't have to, or multiple papers, sorry, you don't have to keep putting that same message section in. You just link to the protocol, the protocol's there. Um, and then that's kind of in a more effective way of, of communicating what you're doing. Um, and there's also a, a nice journal, actually, if anyone uh, wants to have a look at the Joe of the journal Visualize Experiments, where they focus on having a video with every um yeah, well, with every journal and they're mostly uh, methods papers, but uh, having the video of people walking you through the experimental steps can be really helpful to, to get something else going. And another part of open methodology is actually making your methodology open and accessible earlier on than the final journal publication. Um, and this has come about a lot in psychology um, where people talk about firstly pre-registrations. So the idea here is that um, Actually, before you start your data collection, you write down a bit of rationale, a bit of background, and then what you're going to do, what data you're going to collect, what hypotheses you're going to test, and the analyses you're going to do, and then you post that somewhere. And you don't necessarily have to make that public, but um, it's nice if you do, other people can see what you're doing. But the point here is that um, often people would go and they would collect lots of data, they might run a big survey or measure lots of variables, and then they look for some significant correlations or they look they, they, they run some tests and they have a lot of freedom to kind of cherry pick what turns out to be significant and then write an article about that. And the idea of a pre-registration is it kind of removes that question of, oh, did they just cherry pick the, the results that were significant? Because you say up front, before you actually got the data, what, what you're aiming to test. And then you can go and, and link back to that in your final publication and say, hey, we plan to test this. Maybe we found some other interesting things that were unplanned, but you can say clearly what your plan up front was. Um, and going even further than this is registered reports. Um, and the idea here is that you actually have a journal article um, and you submit your pre-registration to a journal article, to a journal, sorry, that gets pre-reviewed. And if they accept the, the pre-registration, then they basically commit to publishing your article regardless of what the results are. But they do have a, usually a second round of peer review after you you come back with the, the results and you've you've written up the article to, to kind of look over things and make sure you followed your, your pre-registration plan. But um, this is a really nice idea because um, it actually gives people strong rewards for doing the pre-registrations um, because you one of the big problems with um, publications is that there's often, often a bias uh, against publishing negative results. Um, you're not going to put in the effort to publish, like to write up an article about negative results because probably a high tier journal is not going to accept it. And so, yeah, the literature is much more positive than maybe it should be based on the results of the experiments that are actually done. But if you're getting accepted just based on your research plan, um, the article's going to get published regardless of if it's a positive or negative result. Um, and so it's aiming to address that um, publication bias in the literature. So now in terms of open peer review, um, this has quite a few aspects to be honest. It's very detailed. I couldn't <laughs> find some good images really to pull us out. But one aspect of this is, first of all, making the peer reviews themselves open uh, in two components. First of all, having um, the reviewers sign their reviews and then also having the re reviews published. So you can look at each of these separately. Um, one reason you might want to have reviewers sign in their reviews is because then it gives a bit more accountability. Um, they kind of typically peer review is done anonymously at like the, the peer reviewer is always anonymous, um, even after the article is published. But yeah, the idea of having the sign reviews is that the, the reviewer's name goes on the, the peer review um, after the article is published. But during the review process, you also don't typically know who the reviewer is. So that gives a bit more accountability. If if a bad article gets published and you were the reviewer, maybe you'll yeah maybe that'll look bad for you. Um, and also then you know that if you are super critical of the authors in your in your review, they're going to find out who your name was, and you can kind of kind of hide behind that novelty. Um, and there's also the benefit of publishing the peer reviews themselves. Like 
peer reviews vary a lot in quality. So if they're going to be published, hopefully we bias towards having good quality peer reviews um, that actually help the authors. And they kind of scroll out, puts them around own and, and write. They contain a lot of information. They're often um, providing additional information that isn't contained in the article um, in, in terms of references to other literature um, or, or yeah, comments or criticisms that, that might not always be acted on by the author. And so having that information published is, is also helpful as well. Um, and then actually kind of moving on from just the idea of publishing peer reviews openly, there's really now a big scene in, in just innovation in, in peer review, which is all based around open peer reviews. Um, so peer review used to just be uh, conducted as part of like the, the journal publication process, but now um, you have groups that are reviewing preprints specifically, and they're just posting um, the, the reviews on those. They don't really care if they're published in a journal or not. You have also what's called um, post-publication peer review, where reviewers are coming and public, uh, reviewing published articles. Now, you might ask, why are you going to do that? <laughs> because like it's already been peer reviewed, but maybe the peer reviews for that weren't public. Maybe the peer reviews find problems with the articles that they, they want to make, um, make known, and this is actually a good way of doing that. Um, there are even instances where people are openly publishing um, critiques of kind of private manuscripts. Um, or, or data. Um, so there's now a whole range of scholarly outputs that are, are being peer reviewed. Um, and ideally, this is a good thing. Um, but I mean, I think it's still a bit early to see like how this is actually changing the publication um, process. But yeah, as I said, there's definitely a lot of innovation happening in this space. And the final thing uh, in terms of open science that I wanted to talk about was these um, open educational resources. Now, I must admit, I don't have a lot of personal experience in this myself. I'm not an educator, but um, one thing to know here is that um, openness isn't just about, in terms of education, isn't just about openness for the student. Like, we, we have a lot of MOOCs now. We have a lot of videos on YouTube. There's a lot of education material that is really accessible for students. And that's great. But... Um, most people can't just take a MOOC and go and edit it uh, and then re reuse that and remix it um, in a way that suits their course. Whereas the idea of um, OER is that you can do that. It's basically the same as all the other open science outputs. You want to have appropriate licensing so that other educators can, can yeah, reuse and revise your, your material and then present it to their students. Um, and actually, if you talk to people who are interested in this, um, librarians particularly, they, they point out some things that you don't think of um, when you're, you're working on other aspects of open science. So for instance, um, posting a PDF to a preprint server is fine for open access and that's great. But if you're posting preprint, uh, sorry, um, PDFs for OER, that's often not very helpful because um, the text isn't usually very easy to edit um, and uh, a lot of educators, uh, they might, yeah, they're familiar with with Microsoft Word or maybe Google Docs, and they want, like, yeah, a document file that they can just copy in there and edit text, maybe do translations, for instance. Um, and they want to be able to do that around the, the structure of the images that are in there. And, and yeah, you can convert PDFs to to Word files. Uh, there, there's software for that, but it's easier if it's actually, like, in a Word file to start with. Or, or equivalent, for instance, like um, open document format. Um, so, I mean, as I said, I don't have too much to, to say about this because it's not really my, my speciality, but the OER Commons is a great resource um, for both material and producing other OER material and also as a repository for um, OER material that's used by a lot of universities. Uh, mostly for, I see mostly um, actually for like high school and undergraduate courses, but I think there's, um, yeah, education material there that covers a wide range of, of, of levels. So in terms of, like, I, I talked fairly quickly about a lot of different things in open science, and I don't really expect <laughs> this is going to change anyone's behaviors, like, straight away. Um, or, but, yeah, if you, if you want to get started in open science, um, the last year, uh, NASA was running the Year of Open Science, and they had this program called TOPS, and they produced uh, a one-on-one curriculum, basically, on how to get started with open science. 
I haven't taken that myself, but I've heard very good things about it. And they're involved um, with kind of consulting the your science community quite broadly. So I would recommend um, for anyone who wanted to get up to speed with with using open science practices in their research that that's a good way to go. Um, if you want something that I don't know, is, is just glance over a paper rather than take a course, then I would also recommend um, the paper on, on the right from a colleague of mine, um, Easing into Open Science. It's written from the perspective of psychology, but it basically takes you through the typical research workflow of, of yeah, ideation to dissemination and, and where you can incorporate um, different open science practices throughout that. Uh, one good thing here is actually when you're in the paper, though, it talks about what what is the, the difficulty of each practice? So for instance, if you're a beginner and you just want to do something simple, then maybe pre-printing is, is the way to go. And then if you're a bit more getting a bit more advanced, then maybe data sharing or, or doing some reproducible code and like going to the actual registered report step is quite advanced. Um, but then it's kind of saying what level of difficulty each of these, these different suggested tasks are, and it's a good way to kind of find a way that you can start doing open science in your research. And yeah, as, as the final thing about open science, it's good to remember that this is quite a part of quite a broad movement. So um, last year or two, UNESCO also released a recommendation on open science that I think was very well written and quite progressive. And um, it takes these technical aspects that are in the green boxes, like yeah, open data and open source, and puts them in a much broader framework. So for instance, thinking about, well, participatory science, opening opening research up to yeah, to citizen involvement, um, opening up the actual infrastructure for research, and also like opening up um yeah, to engage with other like research groups like in indigenous knowledge and local knowledges. Um so yeah, like the, the technical parts of open science I've talked about are really part of like a much broader societal framing for open science. Um and then Actually, open science itself is within a bit of a, a broader scientific reform movement that you might call meta-science. So open science is really about making um, making the outputs of uh, of research open and accessible. Uh, and this, I, mean, I mentioned, has been kind of yeah picking up over the last fifteen years. And this is actually also the time frame over which kind of the so-called reproducibility crisis has been picking up, um, where yeah. Originally in, in psychology and biomedicine, it was found a lot of research results weren't reproducible or replicable. Um, and so they um, that, that community then thought, how can we resolve this? They, they advocated for various measures. Some of these were um, increasing the openness because it was hard to replicate things if you didn't actually know what was done. So like, yeah, it's hard to know how well your data matches other studies if that data isn't, the original data isn't available. Um, but there are also other approaches to improving replicability like um, yeah, improving your statistical methods, for instance, and statistical design, um, or aiming to address different biases that researchers have. Um, and then this up diagram also shows a bit of tie into science of science, um, which is facilitated very much by by having um, the material of open science available. Um, so now you, for instance, have um, science of science studies done that are you uh, with, with data mining because you have the text of um, papers available in open access, for instance. And then you can look at, um, yeah, you, you use kind of large language models, um, which wouldn't have been possible uh, in the past, as well as like using that as an addition to um, the standard practice of bibliometrics. So I guess actually I could take some questions now, because I'm coming to the end of the open science section, I don't know if anyone has any at the moment. Are there any questions from the audience? Well, while you guys are thinking of some questions, um, I, I, I have some questions here. I'd like to comment that, you know, I was a presidential innovation fellow during the Obama administration. and. Um, President Obama was not a technologist, but he was very aggressive at bringing technologists into the U.S. federal government. And uh, at that time, uh, we began an open data movement inside the government and very, very slowly um, tried to get the government to adopt open source 
policies for software that was being produced. And I, I think that is actually happening, um, but these things take really decades uh, to occur. I think the, the US federal government is much better now than it was 20 years ago. Um, and so I, I do think there's some hope for these. My question for you, Gavin, is, is open science going to win? And how long is it going to be before a majority of science is sort of completely in the open science model, as opposed to um, the situation we have now, where um, results are theoretically open, but not open in all of the ways that you have de described here? Um. I think that mandates, for instance, by funders are definitely moving towards um, pushing, yeah, pushing for an open science win. But things, while there are often funder mandates, there's not a lot of enforcement. Um, and I think this has proved somewhat difficult. And enforcement is kind of a bad word as well, because, well, it's a bit difficult because they're kind of checking up on if people are doing the right thing. And there's a lot of trust in the research process, but um so i think for instance like open access publication basically no one starts a new closed access subscription journal now <laughs> only yeah like there are a lot of new open access journals right but the problem is a lot of them are small a lot of them don't have a great name and it's still the big legacy journals that have a, a hold on on academic publications um and so they're yeah they're accepting open access, but kind of on their terms, which is by using article processing charges in order to maintain their revenue. Um, and yeah, to be honest, I think that um, until the, like, yeah, until funders are, are willing to both make the mandates, but then also consider breaking free of the kind of legacy publishing system will be hard for open, at least open access to really win um, in terms of making it accessible for both researchers and, and readers. Um, and actually that's interesting though, because I heard recently that the, um, I guess you have Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, they previously paid open access ch access charges. They they have a open access requirement for, for research publishers and their funding, but they, they're going to stop paying the open access charges and they're going to encourage people to use free, um, yeah, free routes to to open access. So either the, the green route or go through diamond journals. So that is yeah, progressive act, um, step by a funder to 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 push back against high APCs. Um, but that that's just one aspect of, of open science. Um, and I think that yeah, the trend is definitely going there, particularly um, in Europe because Europe sees um, open science as a route to pushing innovation and competitiveness. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure about the position of the US on that. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I can't really speculate about when the, the win is going to happen, I suppose. <laughs> okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions before Gavin goes on to the next section? Okay, well, thank you. Go ahead, Gavin. Okay, thanks, Rob. Yeah, so the next step uh, of the talk will be talking a bit about independent researchers. And so, again, I have some definitions. Um, so, yeah, actually, a lot of people come across this uh, entry on Wikipedia um, that starts off by saying basically that <laughs> the gentleman scientist is still around, that um, we have independent scientists who are financially yeah, wealthy, that they, they can fund their own research and they do so without being part of a public institution. But to be honest, I don't think there'd be many of these around people who are like financially independent doing research for a while. Um, at least that hasn't been the majority of people. There probably is a minority out there doing this. Um, and so I think a, a bit more representative statement is, comes from this book um, uh, that I mentioned from, from the 80s that basically says, well, to be an independent scholar or researcher, I should say that um, Independent scholar, scientist, and researchers use somewhat synonymously, although they are um, that they maybe have some semantic differences depending on who you ask. Um, 
But anyway, this book says independent scholarship. Well, you're doing definitely the, the work outside of the academy, but a key part of this is that the, the scholarly or the academic community actually thinks what you're doing is significant. Um, I think that's quite an important um, statement there as well, because, um, yeah, there were definitely people who were doing their self-funded research who maybe came up with theories that, that were out of line with the, the mainstream academic view. And, and that's not to say the theory is always wrong, but it's good if um, the scholarly community respects the work you're doing. I, I see there's a question from Avnash, I think. Hey, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, I guess... I think you mentioned, uh, you touched on how funders can support open science and how uh, independent uh, researchers who are kind of established can participate in open science. I guess a question I have is, how do new researchers entering the workforce and entering the space compete with established uh, publication routes, established hierarchy, established practices, things like uh, H-index? Uh, things like that, which are used to index researchers and which, uh, you know, are indexed against legacy systems. How do we, you know, like, for example, I have had a lot less involvement with public conventions since I joined grad school. And part of that is I need to publish papers with my advisor in alignment with my lab in certain journals, which Dr. Reed is less interested in. Or, you know, it, it's hard for me to stay connected with open approaches when the existing infrastructure that I'm a part of is so uh, geared toward private uh, research. Yeah, um, I would agree that that is difficult. Um, I think it's hard to provide very general advice, um, but I think a good way to do this is to get involved with um, yeah, like open science communities within your field um, or, or even very general open science communities um, because then they can provide support that your institution might not be doing. Um, okay. and, and to be honest, I'll come back to that um, around IGDOR as well because that's kind of one of the reasons IGDOR was founded. But... Right, right. I guess, yeah, the question would be, are there involvement models for people who are not well established? And I think public invention is one of those involvement models of getting your feet wet and getting started and getting things off the ground and kind of propelling you into the next stage of open science. Yeah. But I mean, as other examples, for instance, um, there, there are like academic communities as well. Like you said, you're in graduate school that are supporting open science. Like I'm not sure what field you're in, um, but in psychology, there's what's called SIPS, which is Psycho uh, Society for Improving Psychological Science. And they, they promote openness and replicability. Um, and a new society recently started in, what was it called? Sorte, which is a society for open, reproducible, transparent ecology and evolution. Um, so, I mean, th these societies are forming. Um, there's also one called AMOS, I think, in Australia, which is a meta-science association. So, yeah, I mean, I would encourage you to engage with those. A lot of them have online conferences or at least some online community that you can attend, um, maybe attend workshops. But actually, like if you if you want to tell your, your supervisor one thing though, is that it is actually demonstrated that um, open access publications typically get more citations than closed access publications. So this is like, like yeah, a good selling point for, for making your work open is even if it doesn't fit in legacy model, even if like, if you're really like committed to open, like, I don't know, diamond open access publications, you might not be publishing in nature or science, but your publications are still likely to get like better citations when you know you account for like the journal impact factor, for instance. Um, sure, yeah. Just I guess not to it. not to monopolize or anything. One thing uh, I've noticed is some of the established faculty members at our university and indeed our department is really geared toward uh, Department of Defense, military funding, and subcontracting. So we have a lot of restrictions on what can be done in that space and as my advisor is you know going up for tenure review he needs to show that he can collaborate with other members of the department so he has to join in uh projects or, or uh legacy models that are private that are you know have restrictions on information and things like that so it, it yeah there's a there's this kind of hierarchical 
uh, flow or I don't know, pyramid going on, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, one thing, there's a kind of a saying mostly around open data um, that you make things as open as possible uh, and as close as necessary. Um, so yeah, like in the case that you have proprietary data or, or confidential data, you can't make that open, but maybe you can make it more open than you would otherwise if you think about it. Like maybe you can publish um, metadata that at least says, you know, a description of what the data is, like how many data points you got, even if it can't say what the data is. Or there are other things that you can do. Like if you have clinical data, there are different anonymization strategies you can use in order to, to make that more shareable at kind of the patient level that, you know, obviously you can't share like confidential clinical data, but you if you disaggregate it, um, there might still be some things you can share. And there are even some like advanced tricks where you you might aim to create synthetic data sets that have the same statistical properties as the data that you got, but none of the data actually comes from real patients, for instance. Um, so there are different levels of um, tricks you can go to to make things more open than, than you would have them otherwise. Yeah. Hopefully that gives some food for thought. I'm happy to talk more about that later as well. Um, Definitely, thank you. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, to come back to to independent scholars, yeah. So there were these two definitions, and, and I think that the, the financial independence is a bit less common these days. Um, and actually, one thing though is that um, even though kind of the old gentleman scholar model has fallen out of fashion, that um, publications by independent scholars are on the rise. <laughs> There's this uh, fascinating, very short study that that just did a bibliometric analysis and looked at the affiliations of um, when people use independent research on a paper. And as you can see, this really spiked. I, I assume that this was related to publications like in online journals um, as an enabling factor, but, um, and even though these are small numbers, like there's only 50 in 2015, 50 publications here, this is almost certainly an undercount because um, this only looked at articles that use independent researchers, but as their affiliation, like basically saying you don't have an affiliation. Um, but people use a variety of terms for this. And actually many people doing independent research um, actually do indicate an affiliation, even though they are for all practical purposes working independently. So it's yeah, definitely a growing um, a growing community, I think, uh, of independent researchers. And another thing to think is that independence maybe falls on much more of a spectrum um, than academia or research than academia are used to. So there's this fun paper at Amateur Hour where um, they're talking about amateur contributions to psychology, but they're using amateur very much in the sense of someone who's not paid rather than someone who's not skilled. Um, and they kind of break down different groups of amateurs um, into two axes. First of all, how much expertise they have and, and also how much uh, they call the expertise distance, but maybe you could think of this in terms of breadth of expertise. And I put academics up here on the, the top left because they typically have a lot of expertise in academic research, but they have very little, or they have they're very, very little breadth of knowledge. They're usually very specific in a field that's necessary to be competitive in academia. Um, and it, naively, you might think that independent scientists are just doing the same thing. But really, there's a lot more writing. Um, you could, for instance, have people working as outsiders that this paper noted. Um, even though academia recognizes that it's really valuable to have um, interdisciplinary work and kind of perspectives from experts outside of a given field, it's really hard to do field transitions within academia. Um, but this can be much easier if you're working independently. Um, and kind of at the other end of the expertise spectrum, you also have, for instance, citizen scientists who are making contributions and um, with or without having too much expertise. And I added a few kind of other colored points on here that I, I think are interesting. You also have patients leading research and, and community research and practitioners have a lot of expertise and they occasionally make um, contributions to, to academic publications and, and perhaps relevant to this community, there are there are makers and um, DIY bio is an adjacent community. Um, and to the extent that they're producing public knowledge, they're all doing in-pen research to some extent. Um, but doing it in a very different way to the, the niche that um, academic researchers have carved out. Um, yeah, and there's kind of this interesting, I always call it um, uh, paradox where 
it's often easiest to be independent when you're within an organization. Um, so a friend of mine wrote this article um, about independent scholarship as a contribution to the knowledge economy. And one of the things she noted was that um, there are now independent scholarship institutes, many of them are online, and they do a lot to actually uh, support and empower independent scholars. Um, even if it's like just really an administrative or um, thing that you you provide them with an affiliation, an email address, um, maybe like a forum or a Slack, then this can really like support researchers to to go out and um, yeah, and, and to, to publish their work um, and do meaningful work. And so with Arika, I'm actually working on um, a research project that I won't go into details now, looking at the, the breadth of um, organizations that are supporting independent researchers. Um, where we're aiming to kind of study what makes these, if there's a spectrum of, of like, yeah, different support that they provide and like, are these kind of just all at just an alternative university or is there different categories of a kind of independent research organization, just like there are different categories of independent researchers. Um, and I kind of got drawn into this, I suppose, by after I joined IGDO and I was an independent researcher and I was part of this organization, I was wondering, oh, what are we doing? How does this fit in? Um, and so then, yeah, we found that there are a lot of organizations out there. Um, most of them are fairly recent besides NSYS, which yeah, has been around for a bit over 30 years now. Um, but they're mostly based in the US. Um, there are a few in Europe, like Igdor and, and Gyros here. Um, but yeah, there's a, a fair bit of diversity here, as you can just tell from the logos. They have a <laughs> maybe a lot more variety of names than than um, universities tend to. Uh, and I, I think, yeah, the public innovation or invention um, could be such an organization um, supporting independent researchers. Uh, but yeah, something to discuss a little bit later on. So finally, I'll talk a little bit about IGDOR. Um, so IGDOR was founded in, in 2016 um, by a Swedish researcher, Rebecca Weiland, um, and she did her PhD uh, and, and felt that she was kind of pushed into using bad research practices. Um, and also then when she graduated, she kind of was being forced to move around for postdocs um, as, as was quite common. Um, and so she wanted to create an institute where first of all, she could be committed to um, doing good quality research without kind of like the perverse incentives of, of academia that you get sometimes. Um, and also where she could kind of have a healthy work environment um, that wasn't as stressful and provided more flexibility in terms of um, where she chose to live. And yeah, so the goals of Big Door um, are basically to improve the quality of science and also the quality of life for scientists. And, and here, yeah, I would also say that science can be used fairly interchangeably with researchers and, and scholarship, um, but it's hard to get a catch-all term for, for these things. Um, so, so yeah, how is Igdor um, doing research? Well, we're aiming to enable high quality research. The way that we ensure that quality work is done is we have what we think is a fairly progressive um, code of research conduct. So I made a little word cloud uh, of it that I put on the right. Um, but basically, yeah, it's fairly stock standard things. Um, the thing is we actually hold our researchers accountable to it. And we have two points that really emphasize Igdor's commitment to open and replicable science. Um, we, we ask all researchers um, to publish their work over open access. And that's kind of important because uh, a lot of researchers at Igdor are independent, so they might not have money to pay for article processing charges. Um, so they, they might be inclined to go towards a subscription model where they don't have to pay, but then we have this open access requirement and we make it very clear that if you post a preprint, green open access is enough, um, but your work's going to be out there. We're not pushing more work into behind paywalls. And we also require that researchers will um, share the data in their publications uh, on request, um, if required for, for validation or verification of their results. And this is in the even open data, but it's something that isn't often done. Like if you write to an author that says the data is available on request in their publication, they often won't respond. <laughs> there are actually empirical studies on, on showing that, that most authors don't respond to data requests. Um, and so we actually have a requirement of our researchers uh, at IGDOR that, that they do respond to such data requests. 
Um, and in future, we might build towards emphasizing even more uh, open science practices in there, but that's what we're starting with. And and we think that's actually still relatively progressive to what um, most universities have for their uh, code of conduct. Um, and then besides ensuring that quality research is done, we also need to um, enable research. I mentioned that providing affiliation, and, and that's also an email address, is very useful. Like, if you write to a journal editor with your Gmail address, they might not take you very seriously. But if you have kind of a addigdoor.edu, oh, sorry, it's addigdoor.org, not edu domain, um, and then an affiliation that's kind of in the database, um, then, yeah, you're much more likely to get taken by a journal editor or, for instance, a grant reviewer and your, your research will be taken more seriously. So that, like, it's a small thing, but it really does enable research. Um, another thing is funding. So having access to funding when you're outside of the um, universities is quite difficult. Funders might like what you're doing, but they typically only want to lend to an organization. So IGDO was founded in 2016, but in 2021, we incorporated as a foundation in Sweden. Um, as, as we had a fair bit of experience with Swedish funding systems. So now we're eligible to apply for Swedish and EU grants. We haven't been successful yet. We have got some funding from uh, philanthropy that were managed through the foundation, but we're hoping to build um, grant hosting further. Um, an interesting point here, though, is that anyone who wants to apply for um, kind of national grants from I don't know, a different country, basically, we would have to uh, incorporate another nonprofit um, in that country. So it, it seems likely that we'll also establish other local branches and become something of a federative model in order to enable um, funding applications in different countries. But uh, we're starting in Sweden for now. Um, and the other thing that we do is we are able to provide ethical review. Um, it's limited to Sweden, which I, I agree. <laughs> the whole Swedish thing is like a bit of a, a big limitation, I agree. Um, but the uh, the reason we, we can provide that is in Sweden, it, uh, the state actually provides ethical review services, um, whereas in most other countries, the individual institution has to set up uh, yeah, ethics, or often called IRBs, Institutional Review Board, or Ethics Committee. Whereas we don't have to do that in Sweden, we can actually send researchers applications off to uh, yeah, the state organization, and then they can do the ethical review for people who are doing, um, yeah, doing work on usually human subjects from psychology. Now, in terms of the um, what it's like to work at Igdor, as I said, we we try and promote the health of researchers and make make sure they have a healthy work environment. Um, we have limited resources to do that, but. The key thing is that we facilitate people working remotely. We're an entirely virtual organization. Um, and that, as you'll see on the coming slide, that means that we have a very global membership. We also, in future, hoping to support provide support for disabled researchers. This is a bit contingent on grant funding, um, but we think this could be possible uh, as another way to um, enable and support um, yeah, broadening the research community. Uh, we also aim to provide, yeah, I guess like social interactions for researchers. Um, so one thing is if you're doing independent research, you can be kind of lonely. Some people like that. Some people don't really like going to departmental meetings or whatever, but um, we, yeah, there are other researchers who leave university and they say, hey, we miss, we miss chatting with colleagues. So we have a forum um, where yeah, researchers can, can discuss topics and we host yeah, occasional webinars and internal meetings. Um, so we're aiming to provide a bit of that community and community support that, that yeah, can help research develop. And yeah, we also hope um, at least to support the mental health of researchers by avoiding the, the pressure to publish that is very rampant in, in academia. So I found it quite stressful when I was doing a postdoc in Sweden, even though Sweden is known for being, or well, having very good working conditions and um, Nonetheless, like you felt a lot of pressure in university, like as a postdoc, you had to publish in order to have a chance of getting a, um, a faculty job and that meant working quite long hours. And oftentimes that's detrimental to the researcher's health. And yeah, like we don't have any publication requirements for researchers. Um, as long as people are, feel that they're actively involved in research, we're happy to have um, researchers uh, join IGDOR, um, even if yeah, they just publish once every few years. And we're also getting a little bit more involved. Oh, 
Rob, do you want to ask a question again? Yeah, if you don't mind. So I, I just want to make a comment that I think this is extremely important. Um, you know, uh, when I was in graduate school, um, I saw people attempt to publish papers that were very low quality um, because they were under tremendous pressure to to do so. Um, and, you know, I quite often now hear of researchers, very senior researcher, who have published 200 or 300 papers. And I sometimes wonder, did they even read the papers that they're a co-author of if they published 300 works? Uh, it just it's it seems like a a distortion of the truth, you know. And science is supposed to be about truth. Um, and of course, there, there's another problem in the United States with, uh, and I, I can only speak to the United States um, with the the tenure track process, which makes it very difficult. For example, for um, someone who wants to be a mother during that period of time, you know, and have a child and devote a significant amount of time to child uh, rearing, whether you're a, a mother or a father. Uh, so um, what we, what I would like to see is a world in which if someone doesn't want to work 80 hours a week attempting to publish research, they can do it. And if they only work 30 hours a week, they only get three eighths of the fame and glory and money that someone working 80 hours a week gets. I, I, I'm not asking for special treatment. I'm just asking for us to break down these walls where we have what you might call a sort of winner take all attitude in academia. Whereas, you know, you're, you're creating an artificial competition between um, uh, in America, they would be called assistant professors to try to get tenure. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's, it's very unhealthy for the people who are involved in it, but it also, it leads to bad science. Um, now, of course, I've written a lot of mediocre paper. Uh, you know, uh, I once had the pleasure of seeing two Turing Prize winners uh, in, have a, on a panel session, and they both said that smart people produce mediocre work, right? But what we don't need is extra pressure to write papers which are just a tiny modification of the last paper that you wrote, or which kind of only barely prove what you're really asserting, you know? Um, and and I, I, I think it would be perfectly okay if we published half as a society, as a planet, published half the papers that we're publishing right now that were twice the quality. There, there wouldn't be anything wrong with that. Uh, I'm, I'm a, on a soapbox a little bit here. I'll hand it, hand it back over to you, Gavin. <laughs> No, I agree. That's a good thought. Um, like, yeah, absolutely. Like this publisher parish, it, it's not just negative for researchers. It leads to bad incentives. Um, it, uh, in the worst case, it leads to fraud. Um, not just like doing a sloppy job, but yeah, like, you know, plagiarism or data fabrication. Um, and definitely there are cases of this where, where people have done this just because they need to, to stay afloat. And um, unfortunately, often once they do it the first time, then they keep doing it and then kind of, yeah, pass it on also to their trainees. Um, you might be interested actually in the, the slow science movement. Um, I believe that's based in France and has some ties to open science there. Um, but yeah, it's basically an argument for less pressure in science. And uh, I think I've read one manifesto that calls for a limit of two publications per year or something similar, just to yeah focus more on, on doing good work and not be under so much pressure to produce quantity. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to mention, um, coming back to the, the mental health as well, that the research, um, sorry, Ingdor has recently got involved with this um, collaboration called uh, Research and Mental Health Observatory, or Riga Terimo. Um, that's a yeah, European funded collective of researchers um, that, that was initially um, based on actually like yeah, getting data about the mental health of research in Europe, but is now actually spinning out some 
uh, interventions based on that. So uh, if all goes well, Indoor is also looking to get involved in supporting some of those interventions, which will probably yeah be online courses for researchers like helping with resilience and um, yeah different psychological support. Well, Lawrence. Yeah, two quick questions. One is um, the one thing I, I didn't see touched off on is the the emergence of uh, infotainment science, um, like applied science or breaking tabs or some of the other ones where they where they do what feels like real interesting, relevant science, but they do it in the public eye. Um, and then they also and then we also have like a, the emergence of like Patreon for for funding these types of things. Um, one of the things I'm kind of worried about, though, is that, or something I think, I, I guess my major question is then, how does that interfere with or accent or kind of distort the public's perception of science? How do you get those people to make high quality journal ready um, contributions? And how do you encourage them to interact with you uh, when they may have like incentive streams and, and funding streams that are unrelated to the traditional um, academic model? Yeah, um, I'm familiar with some people doing yeah crowdfunded research through Patreon and also experiment.com. Um, I think that it's good to have diversity in funding streams because what, what can get funded by yeah, state funders is fairly limited. Uh, but then I agree also that that getting such communities to interact um, with mainstream academia is difficult for particularly if they don't get many incentives to do so. Um, so I'm aware of crowdfunded researchers who um, publish articles or books um, and receive support for doing that. But I think they have much more, yeah, kind of of a niche support base, I suppose, and people who are yeah publishing things and more sharing um, that are more accessible to a general audience. I, yeah, but I, I generally think diversity is good. Um, yeah, the, the one issue, I suppose, is like, yeah, how do you ensure that kind of these public experiments that are that are flashy and catch attention, um, how do you ensure the quality there? Um, and I, I must admit, I'm not too sure because I haven't engaged with them so much. Uh, yeah, I think that science communicators would have, like, people who have experience in science and, and communication, not just like people who, who do the training for science communication, like, have a role to play there. In providing commentary on these things, um, but science communication is is very difficult. So I think it's, it's worth exploring different as different yeah avenues for doing that for engaging. Um, yeah, anyway, yeah, and so I just wanted to wrap up what I was saying about Igdor. Um, I've shown several uh, slides with pictures uh, of. Igdor affiliates and the yeah the researchers the affiliates Igdor really the the basis of the institution. So we recently got to two hundred researchers since two thousand sixteen. Um, so I think that it's pretty good given that it's, we're not paying anyone to get involved and they're kind of just publishing work with our affiliation on. Um, but as I said, yeah, we have a huge diversity of locations which people come from. Uh, I made a web map of of the different. Affiliation locations on our website. And originally, Sweden would have scored more highly here based on kind of founder effects. But we have recently <laughs> seen, you know, US has taken over. I wasn't actually aware. I thought that um, Sweden was probably still ahead, but that's interesting that the demographics are changing over the last year or so. Um, although, yeah, I think we have split between US and, and the EU, really. Um, and also the research fields represented Igdor are also very diverse. So we have some founder effects I mentioned, Igdor was founded by psychologists, but um, yeah, there's definitely also a lot of researchers from um, the natural and applied sciences and also from the humanities at Igdor. So yeah, I would encourage anyone who's interested in Igdor to consider applying uh, to join if you're, if you're doing research and would like to receive support from the institution. Um, and also, yeah, there's this link to our forum. Um, on science and academia, which is a good place to discuss um, Igdor, but also, yeah, general topics around like scientific reform and open science as well. But I'm happy to stop sharing now and answer some questions. I'm going to post these slides in the the Slack as well. Sorry, in the in the Zoom chat. Um, 
So, so anyone can access them if they want. I want to thank Gavin very much uh, for this excellent talk. I suspect we're going to have a lot of questions, but um, I'm going to turn off the recording very soon. I'd like to remind you, if you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, um, that we do have talks like this every third Thursday. Um, the next one, which will be in June, will be a discussion uh, of an invention that I'm working on and I'm pretty proud of. Um, it's a passive ferrofluid check valve which is um, unlike some of the engineering things that public invention has done, is, is a true invention. Uh, it will be presented by Joe Hoshberger, who is assisting me um, in that work. Um, so uh, can we all have a big round of applause, uh, maybe come off camera or uh, use your little emoticon reaction mechanism here uh, for Gavin and thank him for his time. And then uh, I'll stop recording and we'll go into a question and answer session, but thank you everybody.